Hello, 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 hello. It's good to see you. Say hello. Welcome to the Huskies Hockey Podcast, your number one resource to remind you that sellouts and atmosphere be damned. We're not going to have this uh, rivalry here uh, for the next couple of years. Not great, Bob. I'm Weldy, sitting with Andrew here, and we're going to talk. A l- we got a- we got a lot to talk about. It was a heck of a weekend, um, really. For um, it just, I mean, the atmosphere. Uh, the games did not go how I expected, um, no. and I can't imagine. Uh, you know, you you thought uh, that they would be uh, kind of a defensive tight lockdown uh, that they ended up being. Certainly not what I was expecting. Um, I mean, I was a little disappointed by that actually, but they were they were very tense games. It, it I can't say it, it took me back to peak WCHA days, but as close as you can get. When we're talking, this is now non-conference and mm-hmm. coming off of World Juniors and in the middle of you know, Christmas break and pretty damn good games uh, and and sort of tournament type games, I thought. Yeah. And so, yeah, and and for you to be in the building, especially, I mean, it's it's only one. It's one thing watching <laughs> from a living room in a different time zone. How was it in the building? Because it, it did seem, at, at least just from what I was gathering, especially the the, the St. Cloud home game, um, pretty uh, pretty nice uh, crowd and, and a good lively atmosphere. Yeah, over over six thousand in the attendance, and it was it, it was a good atmosphere. Uh, you know, obviously with it being winter break, I was a little bit worried about the students, but you know it was it was mostly full there, um, and it was you know you you can definitely tell people were expecting more of a run and gun and not kind of the defensive, you know, wrestling match that we ended up getting. But I mean, especially after Spalisi's goal, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about that setup too. Um, but you know, when the, it felt like the roof kind of came off the building when he scored that, I mean, it, it, it just went absolutely nuts. Um, and then there were a couple other times throughout the game. I was like, if, you know, if things kind of get going our way or if we pop in one here or like, I think I tweeted out once in the third period, um, you know, after we had a penalty kill and then, uh, you know, where Minnesota was really pressuring, we escaped that. And then we get a power play right afterwards. I was like, if, if we connect on this, this place is going to go bonkers. Um, unfortunately that didn't happen, but we ended up uh, sticking around for a really gritty uh, three nothing uh, asterix win, asterix on the three uh, since it was just uh, two empty net goals. One of them might not be an empty netter, but you know. I you... think it technically, at least when I checked CHN, they're counting that as a as a non empty net goal because if you can see, like he passed close. Yeah, Crookshank passed close, who's coming off the ice during that sequence. So I think they're calling that a regular strength goal, which is mm-hmm. funny, but. So, Definitely put the asterisk on that one. But I mean, as far as like being in in the, in the building, it was there. It was quite the great atmosphere, uh, and it was. I expected actually maybe a little bit more of a vocal gopher. Like you would ever once, like you would get some dueling chants previously of you know, let's go gophers, let's go huskies would end up drowning it out, but you didn't really hear a lot of that for uh gopher fans it was maybe it was just a little bit more of like an older crowd for the gophers uh where they didn't have maybe the college people weren't taking up a road trip um up here or something along those lines just theories but it was a very very pro husky crowd um which was awesome (laughs) obviously to see and um you know just with the whole defensive play on friday and just uh caster i mean we can't really say uh, enough about him really all weekend but man did he come up big did the defense come up big and the forwards too in the defensive zone especially on friday blocking those shots um you know especially during that gut punch um in the fourth 
you know, we had the uh, uh, TV timeout there at like 4.30 or so left to go in the game, and the puck hardly left St. Cloud's end. Uh, but everyone was selling out, and really even Minnesota didn't get, you know, maybe had like one or two quality chances, but, you know, ended up kind of fluttering off their sticks. Yeah, uh, I do think that if we're just going to kind of glide into recapping these games, uh, I do think that the, I mean, so all the World Juniors players ended up playing both games. But I do think that some fatigue was was evident um, in, in you know, Cooley and Snuggerud. Snuggerud had the really nice chance right off the bat mm-hmm. on Saturday. But other than that, I thought he was pretty quiet on Saturday, and, and Cooley was quiet on Saturday. Yeah. And then obviously it takes him until the overtime on Sat on Sunday to to get the winner there. And a, a very nice play. But I do think that the uh, that there was some some fatigue with those players. Um, Pierre, I thought looked fine for the, for the Huskies, um, but you know, playing four games in five five days, and then how many how many total games they play in the World Juniors? Eight, something like that. Um, you know, over a two week stretch. You know, it's it's, and, and then I think you you add on top of that a little bit of rust with the other players because perhaps that goes uh, uh, some way to explaining why these games were such defensive battles. I thought that, you know, and so we we got two goals, not counting those empty netters, whether or not we're counting that Crookshane goal as an empty netter or not, it, it, for all intents and purposes, it was. The two goals that really, you know, they scored with the goalie in the net, both by bottom six guys, you know, Spellacy, as you mentioned, and then yep. Brand on Sunday. I thought another weekend here, even going back to the last Miami game, um, well, going back to that last Miami, three last three games that they played, just two goals scored, uh, and both of them by unexpected sources. Mm-hmm. In one sense, it's nice that these guys are that the bottom six guys are contributing. I, I actually thought the Spellacy line may have been the best line of the week. Hands down, hands um, down. I, and I, I really like. And I will have to say too, I got to eat a little bit of crow because last episode i was just talking about how i don't like the line matchups when it comes to depth and if minnesota is able to really generate a lot of puck possession and get the advantage in the line change and they get you know their first against our third or fourth line it was going to be dangerous not the case at all the bottom six really showed me something this weekend it was impressive in particular, that Spellacy line with, uh, with Rosboro, who's Rosboro and Molinar, yeah, doing a lot. Rosboro in particular is doing a lot to uh, to impress me, just with his effort and kind of his his uh, playmaking ability, uh, and obviously the Molinar setup with Spellacy on on the Saturday, the game winner essentially. Uh, it's just a great behind the back feed and Spellacy there to bury it, but. So that's nice to, that these guys are stepping up. Um, but I thought the Cran- the international line was the quietest of the weekend mm-hmm. here as well. Was, that goes back to the that second Miami game. I thought the Crookshank, Miller, and Kupka line de- de- definitely generated chances. They were maybe the most active line on Sunday. There's a couple of those plays that were frustrating, like the Miller play where they basically had a three-on-one deep in the zone. He does a little sp- spinorama backhand and kind of flutters wide, I thought was their best chance to win that game late. And uh, I, I didn't like the uh, the decision there, but, but that line was generating offense. It's just, it, it, it seemed like the Cranola line was shut down pretty, pretty well. Um, and perhaps that's a decision on their opponents to focus on that line. If so, I hope that they can make some adjustments going forward here, because if you shut down that line, as we've seen, two goals in the last three games combined, uh, it's it's a, it's a recipe to beat this team. But on the other hand, like I said, if you're able to get contributions from from those lower six guys, uh, the bottom six, uh, that bodes well for this team too. Plus the overall defensive effort, um, obviously starting with with Caster. Uh, on Saturday uh, was was fantastic, and and the defense all weekend. You know, going against my didn't take my advice. You know, I said sit Zimmer both nights and and rotate the uh, freshman Reiners and Wiley in. 
Instead, I think uh, Larson goes for the experience mm-hmm. factor with with Zemer, and he plays both both games and plays well both games. I, I thought all the defense yeah. um, played well. I think you know? I think may, maybe is St. Cloud also being a little bit physical, especially on Saturday's game, kind of got Minnesota out of their rhythm a little bit because I think they were also making some uncharacteristically bad passes. I mean, especially Kupka's uh, you know empty netter when Lacombe kind of came in and I mean, that was just an easily read pass and Kupka just jumped it easy. And it, so it was, you know, they, I, I thought they were really smart in a lot of cases um, to play physical and didn't create too many chances where they would call penalties because of little extracurriculars um, um, other than Yami's cross-checking penalty uh, on Saturday. Yeah, and so, yeah, all told, I mean, I guess we'll stick to, stick to Saturday, but just to to try to summarize the weekend as a whole, I wasn't overly thrilled with the Huskies this weekend, but the results were there. I mean, getting a win and then going to re- going to overtime on on Sunday, um, I, is definitely a better result. I just wanted the split, and you got. Essentially, you got more than a split, although the pairwise is is weird. Uh, it partly uh, believes that, partly it doesn't. I'll get to that later, um, <laughs> my frustrations with that. But um, it's just weird because I don't, I don't, what, I, I guess I don't really define this team as a defensive first team. I, I define them more as a, a team that likes to, to, uh, press the action offensively. I don't know what team we should expect here coming down the stretch. I mean, this sort of formula, defensive first and relying on good goaltending, and and let's let's keep in mind too. I mean, Castro's great, but facing what twenty three shots on Saturday and and twenty eight, I think, on Sunday, and that was with an overtime session in there. It's not like the Gophers were throwing forty shots a game here. Mm-hmm. And that's a lot of credit to the defense, you know, getting it, getting in front of lanes and, and blocking shots, but also uh, limiting the grade A chances that the Gophers did have all weekend. So it, it, am I, and I think, so I think that sort of formula is, is a good formula going forward and especially winning the NCAA tournament. But you know, what, what is this? What is, what do you think this Husky team is? Is, is this the team that we should expect with the defensive first? mindset or is it the team that you know in the four games previous to that miami shutout scoring seven goals uh seven and six in the north dakota series and then five in the last game against cc is that more the the team to expect uh uh, or is it just kind of they're going to be able to adapt based on which opponent they play and that's what i think what do you think i I think it's like we're a chameleon you know where we're we're going to be able to really adapt. And I I think it's a little bit different than us, you know, playing to our opponent or, you know, but like understanding that this is the team we're playing, we're going to counter that with, you know, this type of play to really maximize our chances. Um, I do think getting into a run and gun game with Minnesota would have been a bad choice. The fact that we were able to kind of slow it down and control it a little bit more and played stout defensively and uh, really limit Minnesota's chances. And uh, I think that played a, a lot into the decision and it, I think, paid off. And I think having more tools in your arsenal is only going to be better for the long run. But I will say with a little bit of a caveat here, also count the power play goals that we've had over the last three games zero yeah. you know and that's yeah. a, an instance that's been a little bit frustrating for me um and really all aspects of um you know not being able to control or bad s- shot selection or um you know having the chances but passing up uh, scoring or yeah shot opportunities and making one too many passes mm-hmm. and then just all weekend especially on sunday i was just frustrated yeah. with how yeah. few clean shots they got to close mm-hmm. um you know and i think close is the, mediocre the, i mean i don't yeah, i think he's I, a very beatable goalie and right. we didn't and, challenge and, and, him and, nearly but, enough on the power play 
you know, part of that is I think the Gophers played well, cl- clogging up lanes and preventing clean shots to to arrive at the goaltender as well. But I, I, especially when it's getting late in a in a weekend and you you've only scored a couple a handful of goals, like that Miller play, you, you know, just shoot the puck. Mm-hmm. Don't don't try to be too cute, uh, and that that can be frustrating at times with this team. But yeah, so I. I, I yeah, like I said, I wasn't expecting this this uh, series. Uh, and again, I think there is there there was some fatigue factor with those players. I I will say that you know we talked after that Denver series that we didn't think that we were going to face a better line than the Mazer, Dornback, and uh, Rizzo line. This uh, nice Snuggerud and Cooley line, especially on Sunday, it's like whenever they were on the ice, it was it was apparent. And I think this was not the, those players were not at a hundred percent, you know, energy wise this weekend. This was not, we didn't see the, the best version of that line, but I think if we do see that, that number one for the best version of that line, that definitely, I think gives that Denver line or even that Western Michigan line, which is, you know, leading the league and, you know, leading the world in points gives the, both of those lines run for their money. I, I think that's a very talented line. Although I will sort of, I think you were kind of hinting at their bottom six. I don't think was very impressive. I, I wouldn't call them a one, one line team. Cause I think still got guys like Brodzinski and Nelson who I think are decent players, but that third and fourth line for them, I don't think was, was all that hot either. Um, so, and I was, in, it was interesting to see how they were playing that spell C line. I made note that they were on the ice for the second shift. Uh, on the Saturday game there were, uh, and I think at that times they wanted them to, to face the Nyes and Snuggerud and Cooley line as sort of a defensive matchup with them. Uh, I didn't see that as much on Sunday. Perhaps that's the benefit of being able to have last shift at, at home. You're able to match up the, the lines that you want, but interesting uh, coaching decision there, which I think was effective um, cause I, again, I like that line all weekend. That's the spell C, uh, Molinar and, and Rosboro line like them a lot. So it just was, it was surprising to see these kind of games, but at the same time, it was still entertaining weekend. And you know, said, uh, I'm not going to complain with those results either. So you obviously watching on TV, I had an excellent view at, uh, Jackson Nelson's, uh, goal that was that. You know, I was like, that looked about three feet high. <laughs> like, well, even um, on TV, was it that obvious even, as well? Even or? Nelson barely did like a celebration. <laughs> I thought, I thought, I think he thought that it wasn't going to come. Yeah. I was mm-hmm. a little worried. I mean, the, the, both the announcers are like, yeah, this, this ain't going to count. I was a little worried at first because, you know, they called it, called it a goal on the ice and you got to have one. Un- uncontroversial yeah. evidence to overturn it and one camera angle seemed to be un, you know inconclusive but it was fairly quick uh review that i yeah i don't think anyone was really complaining about that one even from the gophers uh yeah even from the gopher side so yeah not not surprising but again whenever you have the the referees make the <laughs> goal call you really whenever do have you to have sweat an nchc review that's right you always just clench up a little bit because right. you never know so um like yeah like you said Spelsi, i mean his goal too um or molinar deep in his own end um you know able you know not you know, you lose the face off, but you know, Molinar was kind of able to to pinch it back and you know control the puck, get it down low, um, and then just made an, an impeccable uh pass that you know uh Rossboro kind of gave a little bit of misdirection to, um, and then just found Spellacy and then he just he just whipped it. And I, I hope I mean, obviously, Salquist didn't take that advice because I felt like he had a couple of chances, both Saturday and Sunday, that I felt like he just missed it or pat tried to make that one extra pass or whatnot. When it's just like, just fire the puck. Like uh, uh, Salquist, a little bit was I, otherwise he played fine, but there were a couple of those chances where I was like, just fire the puck. On Sunday, he had one shift where I texted Buddy like, what? He's uh, not playing well right now, but and then he ended up getting credit for the goal 
it was quickly changed to brand because it yeah. turned out Sulquist. I think it went off the Gopher defenseman. I think that initially mm-hmm. they thought it went off Sulquist, but uh, Brand ended up giving hitting that goal. He was on the power play as well on Sunday. Sulquist was, and it's just at this point I would rather have yeah. Spellacy. I can't believe I'm saying this. I would rather have Spellacy <laughs> in that role if you're going to have a guy. Which I'm what what Sulquist was trying to do on that power play is just park in front of the net and be a screen yeah. and be a tip guy. Put put Spellacy there. He's bigger. He's scrappier. Uh, you're not looking for a skill guy at that point. And that was the thing. I was like, I noticed he was on the ice because he was trying to do Hear some playmaking out. behind the net. It's like, no, park in front of the net. Stay there. Don't move. Like, that's what you do. But <laughs> I don't think he's naturally, naturally good at that. Hear me out. Hear me out. Here's who you should put in that position. You know who I'm going to say. I already been. Rosborough. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. Rosborough's like six two. Yeah, <laughs> have him out there, um, and and park him in front of the net and and uh, try to the goalie to 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 move and uh, kind of peek around that guy. So, um, yeah, but um, you know, you know, just firing it on net. You know, spell C. Happy to see Crookshank uh, get one. Um, uh, they're also at the end, even though it was an empty netter. Um, but you know a little bit of frustration for me did come with that, that top line. Um, Kronola, Mietnin, and Okabe. I thought Okabe played well. Yep. Um, M- Mietnin, though, oh, I did not think Mietnin had a good weekend, yep. and especially in that overtime when he's trying yep. to go one on three with, you know, a minute left or 40 seconds left, and then uh, Gophers, you know, got it down, ended up scoring the game winner. I mean that play was like you got to be smarter than that. At that, I, I didn't like the, the tie. Yeah, you know, well, they were playing for the tie, which I think is kind of. I didn't like their game plan all all overtime on Sunday, but um, I don't. I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves. So we can maybe stick well, on stick on Saturday, or at least maybe segue into the Texas big decision to the text exchange yeah. that we had. Yeah. Um, so so I even tweeted out too. I was like. I I think you go with Bassey. Uh, my whole thought process was you dance with the girl that brought you. And this has been all season. And I know, obviously, Caster played incredibly well. But Wouldn't that be more think... dancing with the gal that brought you? Uh, the, the, ga- the gal that, brought, that, that brought the you shutout to on fifth, Saturday? The, the brought you to a 15-4 and four record. That's who you did. That's what I'm talking about is that's the dance floor is the overall record. And I, you know, maybe it's not right. to And I get the aspect of rewarding caster for a great game, but there's a, there's a push and a pe- and a pull. You know, I've been reading Brandon Sanderson, Mistborn trilogy here. And there's, there's, a, there's, a, there, you know, that Alamancy has kind of been in my head right now. So there's, so there's a little bit of iron to my steel here when it comes to the push and the pull. And that means whether you mean it or not, you're punishing Bassey by not giving him that sac- that Saturday game. And I felt like you should have had him. Now, does that mean maybe Colorado College, he's going to get both games or he's going to get the Friday I say, start? I say, go, I, I say put him in on Friday. And if he plays yeah. really well, throw him in on Saturday again. I like the I like the decision. I didn't expect it. I expected Bassey to be in net. I was pretty surprised when I saw Caster yeah, doing the warm ups, um, you know, before the game on Sunday. I was but, just worried about striking lightning in a bottle twice. No, nah, that's I, what I was worried about. I, you know, he played great. I, I, and I was thinking too. I was, I was expecting the Gophers to win on Sunday, no matter who played mm-hmm. um, in net. And I was, I was prepared to give Caster the 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 pow. Uh, if he only played on Saturday, because I think that he was the main reason that the Huskies won the game on Saturday. Mm-hmm. And just to get a split against the Gophers is, I think, a huge result pairwise uh, in terms of pairwise. And so that's one of the bigger wins of the year. And because I think Caster was the difference, he would have been the player of the weekend. Him playing both games of the weekend and then playing very well, I thought, on Saturdays or on Sunday as well. It makes it a slam dunk pow yeah. for me and maybe for you and maybe maybe for for uh, Go Huskies Woo too. I, I'd be willing to bet. But uh, but I like the I like the decision. Um, 
you know, you you called it a hot hand fallacy, which I think might be fallacious if you if you still go with Caster again on Friday, which might sound weird, but I, I think that there would be a, a terms of per, perhaps reading in too much to a to a hot hand when it comes to splitting. You know. We're going from Sunday to Friday. I don't think that that sort of momentum will carry you over five days. Over one day, though, and and against the same opponent, I do think that that's a good that's a good move. Um, that that there is the thing you mentioned about the potential to piss off Bassey. You don't want to do that. Um, that's why I think that you bring him back. I expect, because he's got the extra motivation against CC this weekend, being his former team and whatnot, and he he pitched a shutout against them. The last time they played CC, a month and a half ago or whatever it was. Uh, so I would go. I would go with uh, with Bassey on Friday. And again, I, I'm 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 much more a fan of a coach or a manager um, making gut decisions like this, and rather than yeah. rather than a set schedule that is regardless of of, of results. This, you know, the, that reminds me of, you know, the twins pulling their starter after five innings because, hey, it's the third <laughs> time through the orders coming up. You know, uh, it's just it's too sort of data reliant and not I was I, 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 I was, rather go with the gut there. Sure. I was I remember when I was a kid, too, and we used for a long time. We used uh, maybe not a long time. That might be a little, but it felt like a long time. Is that we used Johan Santana when he first came to the Twins as a reliever for like three years, and he would. <laughs> okay, so it was a long time. It felt like a long it time because it way was too a long. long time. It probably cost him another it, Cy Young. Actually, it probably did because he would he would go in for two and or for two batters, not two innings, no, two batters, and he would have four pitches strike out one and the other one was a lazy ground ball and then tom kelly would come out and pull him that'd be be guardy at that point we can't blame tk it was all it was all guardy at that point Mm. well man all all my my twins era is confusing to me but and then yeah tom kelly was was the one that actually won in the postseason (laughs) the other ones we can't say that about yeah nobody else uh can um, except Moneyball. Money, money, Moneyball was the reason why we were right. postseason. I think, right? Um, but it, but I mean, I remember that just being like, keep him out there, or let's like, like he's clearly just mowing down people. And then we finally put him in the starting rotation, and he has you know one of the most dominant pitchers that I remember as a fa- being a fan of. Um, so you know, I do. You know, I, I, I do also get the aspect of, you know, anytime uh like a starting quarterback goes or everyone's like, oh, bring it like with Ponder. Everyone wanted like what? Not not Spud Webb. Who was the uh, Joe? Webb. We had a backup. Or no. Yeah. Was it, it was like, yeah, I think some, that was something. Webb. I, I thought I can't remember. Joe Webb know. might have been the the guy who started in the C- TV series Dragnet. Um, <laughs> maybe that was another Webb. I don't, I don't know. It was someone Webb, though. You're right with Webb. And then what was it? Everyone was clamoring for like Cloud Bethel Thompson. I remember for him to start, and it was just. And then they, anytime they would get game action, they'd just be terrible. It's like maybe coaches do know what they're doing at times, and but you know that one time I was vindicated with Johan, and now that's all I think about too is you know just being vindicated when it comes to, um, you know it's like putting people in. I can't even remember what the original point of my rant was. Well, no, I. I mean, I, there was a risk of the fact that the pl- the platoon, the the Bassey Caster platoon, had been working like a charm, um, for most of, you know for the first half of the year, and so there is the risk of once you switch it up, that maybe that mojo is gone. I, based on Caster's performance on Sunday, uh, the short term results were fine for for, yep. for going with Caster both nights. Yep. But, so I ended up being wrong on that point too. So I will eat crow on that one. But maybe not because if this it was, uh, this it was kind of rattles Jack Webb. Jack Webb. There, Jack. Webb. That was the Dragnet guy, or that was the Vikings quarterback. No, that was Dragnet. That was Dragnet. Okay, I knew it was okay. Uh, Did you ever watch Dragnet? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. 
I grew, you know, I grew up on the Nickelodeon, but we all would would still watch like Nick at Night too. So I, I watched like that. I Dream of Genie, all those like '60s shows too. When I was growing up, I I remember like Bewitched was one that was on Nick Nick at Night and I Love Lucy and whatnot. Um, Dragnet, I never really. It was was Dragnet like like the precursor to Law and Order, or was it more comedy? I would say it's, or like what was? Oh no, it was it was a drama. I, yeah, probably a Law and Order pre, uh, precursor. But I think it's the the main show that the Naked Gun is trying to spoof. Um, okay, and so it's yeah, it was definitely a, a a serious show, but it's got. I'm sure I haven't watched it decades, but uh, I'm sure it's got some nice camp value uh, to it at this point but um but a- anyway uh, uh yeah i i do think that now that and it ha- was joe joe webb joe was, was the quarterback the, now we're squared away on our webs now we got everything that's right kind of squared away. but so now you so now that you've changed up this rotation it's not all perfect you know one guy's got friday one guy's got saturday Maybe the Saturday Sunday screwed everything up. The fact that they were going on Saturday Sunday instead of Friday Saturday, uh, and, and maybe it's not great, the same. Bob. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but uh, but uh, now you have. I mean, it's not over. It's you still have decisions to make, and you might have a decision to make every single game now. Uh, not having the set rotation, and maybe going by more of an intuition or. How did the guy play last night? I don't know. Did did the fact the factor that or did the fact that Bassey was in net for the five nothing loss at Miami did that play in, into any of this? I don't know. I think it was more so the shutout uh, on, on, yeah, on Saturday. It had to have been, yeah. I mean, if he gives up one goal, uh, you know, and maybe they they still win. Let's say I don't know. They scored another goal, and then Castro gives up a goal late. Does he come back on Sunday then? I, maybe the fact that he literally shut him out. I don't know if that was the deciding factor. Just from the eye test, he played really well. That Snuggerud uh, breakaway chance, what was that, two, three minutes into the game? Perhaps yeah. the biggest turning point in the game because, you know, and it was a great save by Caster. Like, he he got his pad over, he read the move, and he stoned him. And if that goes in, it's... Uh, butterfly effect totally different game i think mm-hmm. maybe you are kind of at that point you're stepping into a run and gun situation with the gophers which you might not want I and mean, it might be the not might, might not be the best uh plan so uh some huge key saves there key saves down the stretch and thought he played really well on sunday the the two goals he's, they scored on him he no fault of him i would say uh you know the one tip on that power play chance, and then the Cooley and play. Even, I mean, they, you could say that he maybe bit all early on Cooley, but still, that's uh, yeah, it's a pretty damn it's good, three good play. Three on three, whatever. Yeah. Um. Even that knives tip. Um. When you know in that third period, a couple minutes in, and you know, I always worry about power play on fresh ice. So, um. You know they. Geez, that wasn't a power play, was it? Hold on a second. The knives goal. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah Gophers. Was hard, Gophers right? did not score a five-on-five five goal all weekend, which That's I think is right. I think yeah. is impressive. Just the power play goal mm-hmm. and then the three-on-three three goal. Um, yeah, and like even his reaction too, because you know Anhorn was kind of in a rock between a hard place here because he had uh, somebody else kind of covering too, and uh, you know the um. Uh, other, um, you know, the Huskies player, I can't remember who it was offhand, but he maybe bet a little bit too hard on Cooley, was able to thread that needle, that, you know, shot past to Nice, who was able to kind of tip that in. Even Nice's reaction, too, it wasn't like this big jump into the corner reaction. It was like a, more of a sigh of relief. Yeah, it was like a finally, <laughs> we solved him. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then credit to the Huskies um, and uh, Brand and, you know, you know, again, that uh, depth really kind of showing up and uh, getting that chance and ended up uh, putting it in the back of the net there. And um, it was um, kind of another type of game where, again, obviously I didn't expect it. It was it was maybe a little bit more sluggish in a way. Um, maybe it's because I also I wasn't in the building. 
But again, Big Ten rules. Only one media timeout at the 10 minute yeah. mark and like the 12 minute intermissions. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, if we could adopt that, I'd be incredibly happy with that. But, and then, yeah, like I said, overtime, my, my big issue there, you know, with, uh, Mietnan, um, you know, he, trying to maybe do a little bit too much. Maybe he's getting a little bit frustrated that the goals aren't really coming again this year. And again, he's just not getting to the prime scoring chances and he's, he's got to work on that power play because he is not, um, you know, that has really been drying up and we had the chances on the power play, but just yeah, good puck, you know, good puck movement, just not finishing uh, on those chances. Yeah. Actually, you know, I, I thought that Huskies played pretty well on Sunday. Actually, I, I didn't, um, I'm not going to say they played better oh, I agree. Yeah. on Saturday, but, um, and I would say the Gophers maybe had the slight advantage um, throughout the weekend in terms of, you know, prime scoring chances, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, you know, lopsided in that, in that regard. Um, as you said, it was a, a huge, unexpected. Once it, once the nice goal, because it seemed like the Gophers had been buzzing, uh, you know, latter part of the second period. First half of the game, I thought the Huskies maybe had the slight, slight edge. Uh, but then the Gophers kind of turned it on in the second period and then brought that over into the third. Converting on that chance, I thought, and here we might have the one nothing maybe with a couple of empty netters going against us on Sunday, but then sort of a fortunate play, you know, Bushy coming out of the box there uh, and starting that three on one Bushy, you know, offensive force uh, starting that play and, and getting, uh, you know, get him on the power play, him and Rosborough, get them on the power play right now. Put Bushy in that Dan chronic role, you know, (laughs) try to try to move him out of the way. Why not? Um, (laughs) I mean, Remember when we tried that with Ben Storm? <laughs> tried that for like <laughs> that a whole season, sure. putting him up and, and uh, as a forward. Yeah, it didn't didn't work all that all that <laughs> hot. So, but you know that was a nice uh, unexpected turn of events there. And like I said, still had some chances uh, be, you know, past that. I, I didn't like I said I did not care for their their game plan and overtime. It seemed like they were on their heels and just kind of playing for the tie prevent defense, which is never a good idea. Uh, and it's too bad that, you know, they couldn't get that tie as it turned out. Um, yeah. I've said this before uh, and I'm going to make it quick. Cause I'm sure I, I get the feeling I'm really the only one that really cares about this or has a bug up their butt about it. To the extent that I do, but if RPI is counting overtime, results differently than regulation losses the head-to-head comparison in pairwise needs to reflect that as well because as it stands now gophers have the rpi advantage on the huskies the huskies have the common opponents edge because of their their six and zero in the same opponents that the gophers have played north dakota mankato and wisconsin gophers have a loss to mankato in there so they win that comparison so it comes down to head-to-head which they're counting as one and one one win for each team. If the RPI says that the Huskies get 0.33% of this as a win and the Gophers get 0.67 of a win, it should not be an even one-to-one split. And the thing there is, if the Huskies were to have the advantage head-to-head, which the RPI seems to think it is, then they would win that, it, they would win that comparison against the Gophers. But as it is now... The comparison is tied and RPI is used as the tiebreaker. So the Gophers, as it stands, win the win the comparison to St. Cloud because they're counting these overtime losses the exact same as regulation losses in the head to head. You need to clean that up. It's either make either change the RPI and give 100 percent of the points to these for these gimmick three on three overtimes or Use the head-to-head, uh, uh, put the 1.3, the 1.6, put the, don't count the overtime losses the same. Something is is inconsistent there. So, and it would be a big deal because, like I said, if, if that was reflected a- accurately, as it is in the RPI, St. Cloud would win the pairwise comparison against the Gophers, and they'd actually be tied for first. Be them, Quinnipiac, and the Gophers would all have 60 pairwise, uh, you know, wins or whatever it is, pairwise uh, comparisons. Again, if you didn't make any sense of that, I understand. 
it's uh, esoteric and whatever. I but, actually think you laid that out incredibly well. <laughs> it's just, I mean, the, the, the system is confusing and, and, and you know, kind of baddie anyway. And as we but. mentioned earlier this season, it took them a whole year last year to figure out that their math and the RPI was wrong. It was actually giving team road teams that lost overtime more of an RPI point advantage than the team that the home team that won in overtime, which is just insane. But you need to clean up this head to head too. You know, a regulation win should not like be the you, same as you an overtime. Thought that win. would have been like found out by then too. It's well, like maybe it's like wait a they'll minute. They'll find out about this <laughs> this head to head, which makes much more of a difference than percentage points on the RPI. They'll figure that out within like the next three years, hopefully, and maybe clean this up. Hey, it's like I said, maybe it's moot and it's not going to make that much of a difference. But at this point, right now. It's cost St. Cloud one pairwise comparison against the Gophers. And that could be the difference between like being a one seed and a two seed in the tournament. So we're not just talking about small differences here. So anyway, if they would have waited the 18 seconds and bled out the rest of the overtime, they would have definitely won that pairwise uh, comparison because that would have gone down as a tie. So that was a big deal, uh, that goal. Which we would have done if Mietnin wouldn't right. try to go one on three. That's right. But, um, so, go Huskies, woo, uh, player of the weekend, pow. Still don't have a sound effect for that. Maybe we could ask Go Huskies, woo, what type of sound effect that he would like. Maybe, maybe he wants the toilet flushing sound effect. No, we're using that for our next segment. Um, maybe oh, maybe that's we right. could maybe have him like record him saying pow. Like, let's do a little, maybe, or maybe get, like a punch. That get... Like do like a, like a Indiana Jones oh, punch uh, sound should, effect. We should, we should do like a Batman sound there effect. You go. How about that? I'll, I'll, See if you can get a, the yeah. get the rights to that, I and mean, make yeah, sure we got yeah. all of, all of our legal uh, 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 considerations uh, in order. So Adam to, West, Adam West is dead, right? He died. I think we can ask the estate. Um, someone there at at Adam West Inc. dot com, I think can uh, can help us out there. But yeah, either like a Batman oh, sound geez, effect two thousand seven. 2017. Wow. Okay. That was a while ago. R.I.P. I, th- I thought it was more recent than that. So, so, so then the Go Huskies woo pow. Pow. He, uh, right after Cooley scored. And so it was pretty much a no brainer for him. And so it was about 20 seconds after the game ended, he was like, uh, caster. <laughs> it was and like, there was no doubt in it. Yeah, there's no doubt in his mind. There's really no doubt in any of our minds. But he also did wanted to um, uh, give a shout out to that uh, that that Spellacy line. Yeah. And you know we've raved about it quite a bit, and totally agree. He that uh, that line was uh, really gave the the Gophers all they could handle, and was a really big thorn in their side all weekend. So. Huge shout out to them. If they keep playing like that the rest of the year, it's, it's going to be um, an incredibly fun, uh, you know, kind of uh, trip the rest of the way. So, um, yeah, and if only Mason Salquist could hit the lake from the end of a dock. And I agree with that. Um, but uh, Joey Molinar also, he had a really strong game. Uh, Spelsy, if. If Caster didn't play on Sunday and something went differently, I would maybe lean towards Spellacy, um, as also kind of a, um, a flag bearer for that line. But um, in the end, uh, I don't think there's any debate here with uh, with Go Huskies. Woo, myself, and it sounds like you as well. It's mm-hmm. Caster. It's got to be. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to give the love to the goalies. You know, I haven't done that all year because they've been splitting time and. It is weird to give out a pow to a player that only plays one game of the year or one game of the weekend. But I mean, just to remind folks, uh, Caster, 11 games played, 927 save percentage, buck 90 goals against. Bassey, 179 goals against, 930 save percentage. These are all elite numbers. Um, yeah. Are they going to stay that high? Who knows? Maybe, maybe not. But um, maybe there is some regression there. But 
based on this weekend, I mean, again, this is a, a high flying goal for his offense. Most goals per game scored in the country coming into this weekend. That might be different mm-hmm. now because they were, like I said, zero five on five goals uh, this weekend for the Gophers. That's no mean feat uh, for any team. So, and yeah, and, and had a chance to win both games here. Like, it's, it was, uh, it, the results here exceeded my expectations. If how they got there uh, kind of defied my expectations, but <laughs> however you add it up, even if you add it up incorrectly, uh, Mister Mister, even Mr. if you Pairwise, add it up like the pairwise does, <laughs> still uh, a, a thumbs up weekend for me. Indeed. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and change gears a little bit and go, uh, head to this weekend. Then yep. Colorado College, you are on team Start Bassy then. I would. I, I, I'd give him the Friday start and see how he plays and potentially give him both games. Um, I kind of like that idea even before this weekend. Um, you know, I, there's been, what, two or three times so far this year that I have proposed splitting up the, the Friday-Saturday split. Uh, my, my original thought was give, give both of these guys a weekend of their own I did not think it would be coming in the Gopher series, but I did mention the CC, right. the CC series as the one for Bassey, because like I said, coming from CC, transferring over there over this past off season, uh, I think he's got a little extra mojo um, or a little extra motivation to play against this former team. And the one game he played in the Springs this year, he shut them out. And so I, I like that. I also, I'm, I'm a little, so I think prior to this weekend, the three like biggest emotional, emotionally taxing kind of biggest uh, weekends of the year for this team, I'm thinking the Mankato sweep, which ended sort of in a kind of a high, an on high fashion with the Kupka play behind the net to, to Crookshank. Then I think he had the Denver series out in Denver, which was kind of a slug it out. It went to overtime and then a you know, one goal game on Saturday. That was an emotionally spent weekend. And then the North Dakota series where you swept them coming in on a high. What's the uh, commonality in the weekends following those emotional, emotionally taxing weekends? You, you lose a game in each case, you know, losing the game to Bemidji coming off the Mankato series losing the Friday game against Western following the Denver series, and then losing that five, nothing game on Saturday to Miami after the North Dakota series. This was another one of those emotionally taxing weekends and, you know, former, former, I should say, uh, former conference rival, uh, certainly Kurt, still current in-state rival in the Gophers, big crowds, lots of energy. There's a, there is a fear from me that this is going to be a letdown weekend. Um, and I hope that's not the case. And I think maybe starting in Bassey, who did not participate in the Gopher series, is a good uh, way to stave off any sort of emotional letdown because he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't have any of that. He didn't tax any of his emotions this weekend, at least not on the ice. Uh, maybe he was frustrated that he didn't get in there on Sunday. But maybe using that as a as a springboard here, uh, and, and again seeing some old foes uh, or old friends uh, in, with the uh, gold and black with the tigers, uh, perhaps that's a good way to stave off any sort of emotional letdown. I, I am sort of worried about that, just based on the history so far this year of, of that happening. And like I said, this was a this was a a big weekend. And again, I, you, you can't overlook CC. Uh, they're a third place team, three points behind you in the, in the standings right now. Yeah. Um, and so can't take this team lightly. Um, and, but at the same time, we've, we saw the series in CC in November, you know, you had the, the close one on Friday, had to rely on a late goal there to beat them. Uh, but then winning pretty handily on Saturday and that was the game that uh, Bassey was uh, through the shutout. Um, I do think that St. Cloud has the talent edge uh, on on CC here. 
and especially if you want any hopes of of uh, Penrose, I think you got to sweep them here. But correct. I am not. I'm not going to go ahead and call that. Like I, I just have a, a bad feeling. It's like the bad feeling I had against you know the Bemidji series and. And so I, I'm, I'm not going to go out and claim it. I'm not going to say that they're going to split either. I, I'm just going to abstain from picking this weekend. Just boo. You know, you know what we, you know, I, I'll say a, I'll say a, a, a win and then an overtime result. I'm not going to say that. I think they're going to get, they're going to get less than six points this weekend. But, um, but you don't need to make it into a bad weekend either. Uh, and. Yeah, you, you know what you're up against, and you know it's a CC team did not play last weekend, so they perhaps are a little fresher, perhaps a little rusty. Who knows? It's the rust or rest question. But uh, seeing as you know, kind of what what you got here, uh, seeing them relatively not that long ago, uh, I, I do hope for a good weekend here. Especially you know you're going in after this series, you got Denver coming in next weekend, so. Again, if you want any sort of chance, Denver's got Miami this weekend. So if you want any chance of keeping yeah. pace with Denver, you really got to take care of business and get six points this weekend. But again, something a sneaking feeling. Don't like it, but I have a sneaking feeling about this weekend. I, I'm hoping you're feeling a little bit more confident than, than me uh, facing these yeah. Tigers. I I am. And I see what you mean about the Bemidji, but you know, as far as Bemidji, Bemidji plays a completely different style. And traveling up there after, like you said, an emotionally taxing, you know, two one goal wins against the Minnesota State. It's, you know, playing that totally, completely different team, you know, that threw us off of our game altogether. Um, I think the fact that we won on Friday or on Saturday against Minnesota, how we did and how we played also on Sunday, I think we're just going to continue with that energy and that mentality but also make a couple tweaks to the power play that's going to end up getting that rolling. Uh, Colorado College has really good special teams, um, yeah. or has you know as an 81 percent, I think, or so on the penalty kill. So I mean, everything's solid there when it comes to um, you know when it comes to our special teams. But you know, St. Cloud being able to really put the pressure on and you know, locked down. Obviously we're playing a team with not nearly the firepower as Minnesota. And so if we play with the same type of mentality, um, I, I think this is going to be a kind of a series where I think the team knows it. And I think everyone's, everything's going to kind of come together this series. Uh, we know we can play with the best in college hockey um, with, uh, you know, results against Denver with the results against Minnesota. Um, and I, I think we're just going to kind of go out and, and put the pedal to the metal and really take it to, to Colorado College here this weekend. So I am going to predict a sweep. Um, if not, I do think it's going to be incredibly tough for our Penrose chances. Yeah. Um, so that's the, these, these are the games where we need to make up points. We already dropped one to Miami. That's right. too many points already given up um, when, it, when it comes to that. So. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I I really like her chances. Yeah, I mean, they they have the talent advantage on CC. I think that's clear. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, hockey's weird. Uh, weird yeah, things can happen. Um, you know, we should mention. You know, they had two guys of the World Juniors: Noah Laba, one of their forwards, and Caden Barico, the goaltender, who started the World Juniors as the uh, as the starter. For the Americans, but ended up losing that job to Troy Augustine. Trey Augustine, one of the two. Trey, Troy. Uh, and Barico ended up place. ended up uh, coming in relief in that third place game, which I missed. I watched the uh, the Canada game, um, but I I missed the third place game, which apparently was a wild game, eight seven. Um, and Barico, I believe, was the winning goaltender in that game because he came in in relief after Augustine gave up four or five goals. Um, and we saw him in, you know, against the Huskies earlier this year in Barricum, I'm saying chased him in the second game, you know, getting pulled. He's an interesting goaltender. He's got a little bit of Bobby Geffert in him. I think he's, I, I remember when he uh, was in the net against the Huskies, 
like three or four times he lost his stick. Like he's got a very sort of active presence. Like he's throwing his body, he's selling out all over the place. Can be that, that that could be a recipe for an entertaining goalie to watch. Um, but they were able to handle him pretty well on Saturday. Like I said, getting three goals in the first period and uh, having him replaced uh, in favor of Matt Vernon, another goalie the Huskies have seen over the years. Another former teammate of uh, of Bassey. I, I feel like Vernon's got to be like twenty nine. <laughs> it feels point. like yeah, it feels like he's been around for forever. Like he's on the all Van Wilder team. <laughs> That's right. Yes. <laughs> just... Yeah, yeah, that is right. So, uh, be interesting to see. Like I said, Embarico got both starts in the springs. Wondering if they'll bring him back for both games here. Perhaps that'll depend on how the Friday game goes. But uh, you know, Hunter McCown having a good year for them. Um, Thirteen goals, nine of which are in the power play. Nine power play goals. Nine times. Nine times. Scored nine times on the power play, and, uh, and he's he's got some highlight real goals among those. Uh, I saw the one against Omaha, which is a, a pretty goal. Uh, and he like said Laba's talented in his freshman year. He's already got seven goals. You know, a team, though, that doesn't have a point-per-game score. Um, Huskies have three or four of those guys. So this is not the uh, type of offense that is really comparable to the Huskies. But, again, lots of weird things can happen in hockey. You know, CC almost stole that Friday game out in the Springs earlier this year. Uh, won one game, what, what, three or four minutes left uh, when Anhorn scored the winner there. So could have gone either way on that game. So, um, and, and like I said, third place. They're a competitive team this year. They're not the CC, yeah. the, the the standard doormat that they have been for the last decade in this conference. So I got, that, got to take them seriously. That, that's the thing that, uh, you know, talking about uh, Colorado College and how they've been had a rough go of it over the past uh, few years. The, you know, the last time the Huskies lost to Colorado College was in 2019, November of 2019. So we've had a kind of a good dominant run here. And I do expect that to continue. Um, and I, I want this team to come out and really show me that um, and really propel them to an incredibly strong second half. Once everything, I think this is the weekend things really start kind of clicking on all cylinders so we can get ready for a big showdown against Denver. Yep. yep. Here's hoping. Um, I do want to make a special shout out for um, also for this weekend. Um where it's the, the annual uh, Huskies Eat Tigers um, f- food shelf benefit. Um, if you if you uh, want to, you know, usually about once a year, uh, they'll have, um, you know, social media will kind of get together and do a, you know, pick one se- uh, weekend series where you donate to your local food shelf. Um, all on the honor system, but please do it. Um, you know, um, you know, X amount of goals uh, per game, shots, whatever you want to bet. So if you want to make a little bit pledge to your local food shelf, obviously uh, um, that's uh, all goes to incredibly good cause. Go Huskies Woo is um, <laughs> really uh, piping this up as uh, donating a box of Frosted Flakes um, for for the Tigers, uh, for, for Tony the Tiger. So, but... Um, Obviously, you know, any, any any sort of support there for, for your local food shelf is good. So uh, definitely look at that for this weekend. Um, and I haven't thought about my pledge, actually, just until now. But, you know, I'll probably do something where, you know, X amount of, you know, dollars per goal, more on the power play, and maybe $10 for every Mietnan shot on net on the power play, I think but I want to actually donate money. So I don't know if I'm going to do that one. So, oh. um, uh, anything else, uh, kind of wrap it up this, uh, CC series. I'm, um, I like your, I of... like your confidence and, uh, I, I hope you're right. I hope yeah, you're right. I, I hope I'm right too. So, uh, let's, uh, flip over to our next segment, uh, sinkers and floaters. <laughs> and, uh, Andrew doesn't like this uh, name because apparently oh, floating no. is just ju- is just a staying. Whereas I want to say, you know, he wants to call it sinkers and risers, but I don't think that has got the same ring to it. I, yeah, but. you're you're right, yeah. and I think you can squint and make that definition that you're using about floating up. 
you can squint and that makes sense. So no, I like the bit and hopefully we have the, the toilet flushing uh cylinder <laughs> in the background. Um that's our that's our goal for the second half is to have a little bit more action on the button bar. Have a couple more yeah. sound effects. Hint hint I, more I, wacky. I, I I might keep this a secret. I might be working on a on composing a theme song. Um, Ooh, so man. yeah, we're, uh, we're I gotta I gotta give Clara the axe. Are you is that what you're saying to me? Jeez, that's well no, you can harsh. you can incorporate you can incorporate her into it. It's just getting rid of the uh royalty free generic music um <laughs> as i'm uh as i'm exploring a, a synthesizer that it's bought so that might oh, that might nice. be in the future too but um gotcha you might have to wait a little bit on that but i i'm i'm playing around with it so. the the royalty uh free music is uh harris heller um who is really big into like streaming and having this royalty f- free music. But the uh, name of the song that I picked um, from his library is actually entitled reason to complain, which I think is actually pretty apt for this podcast. So that's our intro theme song is reason to complain. So anyway, <laughs> good sinkers, sinkers and floaters. Uh, the segment here, we're just going to go uh, to Kind of highlight a couple of teams over in um or around the country that has kind of uh, made a big leaps over this last weekend in the pairwise jumped up, and things that have other teams that have kind of sunken out of contention. Uh, so we've got a couple of teams here that we can talk about. We want to start with the sinkers or the floaters. Let's um, let's go with the optimistic part. So let's go with the the teams that have made jumps. Big jumps uh, over over Michigan Tech from 20 up to 13, jumping seven spots into contention for the CCHA. Um, and then CCHA rival, also Minnesota State, um, up six spots. Um, they're starting to knock on the door of the bubble, went from 24 up to 18 uh, in the pairwise. And um, yeah, Cornell uh, making some leaps uh, from 14 uh, up to 11. Uh, right now, obviously, St. Cloud State, um, you know, went up two spots. We kind of flipped a uh, flip flop with Denver after Denver's uh, hiccup against uh, Alaska, which I did call on Twitter saying that Alaska was going to give uh, Denver fits, um, mostly because also Alaska is a, <laughs> is a decent team. I mean, they're sitting right, yep. right now at 21 on the pairwise. So they're they're for an independent. They were one I was kind of looking, but not really looking at for our last uh, um episode uh but i didn't i said if they if they win one of those games against denver it'll make it interesting they got a good schedule well i'm one i'm just wondering how many games they can afford to lose they got 12 games left four against arizona state four against long island two against anchorage two against lindenwood the best of those teams is arizona state who's like 30 27 right now in pair wise and the rest are in the 50s um i'm wondering like they can split those four games against arizona state and then win the rest that going to be enough to get them in the top 16 it's possible it's very possible and they don't have a obviously a conference tournament or or, or whatnot after those 12 games it's once those 12 games are done that's it for them which might be a benefit for them because they can get in the top 14 let's say and then not have to worry about it unless there is a bunch of upsets in the conference tournaments or it could be a hindrance because they don't get a couple of extra games to move up like playing a decent team in a conference tournament so Mm -hmm. if they win all 12 games does that do the trick for them i mean you'd have to think so they'd be 23 and 9 and 2 at that point Mm -hmm. um I mean, they're not, they don't have a ton of great wins. I mean, this Denver win is their best win of the year, and then they beat Notre Dame last weekend. But then their next best win was in our uh, next best regulation win. They, they beat Omaha in overtime, but then their next best regulation win was against Northern Michigan, who's at 42. So their schedule hasn't been great. It's not going to get any better from here on out because, like I said, the opponents they got left. So. I was surprised they, because I think they started at 21 in the weekend, and even with the split at Denver, I think they stayed at 21. Surprised that that Denver win didn't give them more of a boost 
But, you know, if Denver goes on a run for the rest of the year, that win will look better. So they could still gain a benefit from, or if Notre Dame goes on a run too, for that matter, those wins could, could appear to be better. Um, but it's, you know, they, they have, they have a chance. I still, I said, even with a Denver win, it would be like a 5% chance that they make the tournament. And I still stick to that, but it, it, it does make it interesting. It's another wrink. It's an added wrinkle here because they don't have a conference tournament. That is another factor that, will make things a little interesting. But yeah, as you mentioned, Cornell, uh, you know, was a team that we uh, left out of our uh, NCAA tournament predictions last weekend. Uh, Michigan Tech, I was able to catch them in action. I went to the uh, first night of that Arizona State tournament. Uh, Michigan Tech beating Arizona State. That uh, in the nightcap on Friday, Boston University beating Air Force pretty handily in the early game. I was like five feet away from Mike Aruzioni at one point. Ooh. Fun story. Uh, BU alum, and I think he was in the Olympics once. Um, yeah, I, th- I think um, he had an. I think he had a goal. He may maybe. have may have scored in in an Olympic game at one point. Um, but uh, that's probably the most notable thing uh, of that day. It was not the, the tech game was okay and and of the traveling fan bases Michigan Tech obviously showed up they they do have a loyal fan base I'll give them that um mm-hmm. even through, through thick and thin uh they uh, they've got some good fans um so they were enjoying that win against Arizona State uh on that night and yeah they they look decent um and, and, they, and they did end up winning, obviously. They ended, the, and the and then uh, they did yeah. end up winning the Desert Hockey Classic. Winning against BU, and that's a good win for them. Perhaps their best win of the year. BU at eight right now. And uh, certainly would have given BU the advantage um, over Tech just watching those those games on Friday. But Tech got out to a 3 nothing lead on Saturday, and BU made it close, got to within one, but just couldn't get the equalizer. So Tech wins that tournament. and said jumps up makes a nice move uh in pairwise to get into into the gate right now uh and yeah minnesota state kind of surprised that they are able to make such a big jump sweeping northern michigan on the road but uh you know they were my pick to win the uh, ccha or at least get the bid uh, out of that league uh you had tech so i guess Mm -hmm. you're winning that bet for now um but uh but Minnesota State now within uh, spit and distance um, uh, of the pairwise. Um, I think if all of the, you know, of all of our predictions and everything, it would be the most surprising to me if the CCHA gets in two. Yeah. So if yeah. if if Michigan Tech kind of stays above up in this area and able to get maybe one of the last at large spots and. Minnesota State ends up winning in the tournament or whatnot, something like that. It's that that would be a surprise to me. Yeah, I I do think that's a that's a long shot, but mm-hmm. it was not a very good weekend for the hockey East. I don't know if we want to transition this into our uh, sinkers, sinkers segment, but uh, right, right down there at the bottom of the toilet bowl is Providence. <laughs> Providence at I'm looking at 20 right now at CHN. Is that where you got them? Yeah, they they came into the weekend at twelve. So I mean, they, they dropped they dropped eight spots after beating Miramac, who is also near the bottom. Um, when they dropped four spots on the weekend, uh, but uh, yeah, pairwise dropping or Providence dropping from uh, you know, uh, twelve to twenty. You know, they did beat Miramac. Um, but that was last they, weekend. This weekend last week, was last weekend, losing and then they to... follow it up. <laughs> then they uh, follow it up here with a um, two just incredibly bad losses. And it was a loss to New Hampshire, and then a tie to Army, which is about as bad as a loss to Army. Not not as bad, but still, tying Army is not a good result. Army's terrible. They're at fifty seven in pairwise. New Hampshire at forty nine. Um, so. Uh, that did not bode well for Providence, a team that I kind of felt confident about last weekend. Uh, and Merrimack, as you said, they went into this weekend playing Brown and Yale at home, two terrible teams. Mm-hmm. 
and a tie against Yale, and then just getting smoked by Brown. I almost wish that it would take in Merrimack. It said that they weren't going to make the tournament. Even them being at six last weekend, I, I was the least confident of them out of those Hockey East teams. But eh, someone's got to give. Something's got to give this weekend because Merrimack plays Providence. So someone's going to get off the mat. <laughs> someone's going to get off the schneid. You'd think. I guess they, they could have two ties. Uh, maybe that's the most fitting result. Two struggling teams all of a sudden. And then Connecticut, you know, another sort of big draw game. We saw this when they played Cornell at Madison Square Garden what, around Thanksgiving, and they got clobbered by Cornell, UConn playing you know, under the big lights at frozen Fenway uh, outside, uh, and they lose. Um, is that to BC? Or no, Northeastern. Northeastern, who's not having it's that North great East. of a year at 33 in pairwise. And so that dropped Connecticut down. How many spots did they dropped? I think they were at 10 or 11. Now they're at 14. Yep, they dropped um, three spots. They uh, lost four three. comparisons, but dropped three spots. UMass, the other sinker of of uh, hockey East, and there was another team that played. They were the team that lost to BC uh, at Fenway. They had two outdoor games on Saturday uh, there, and uh, UMass uh, down to twenty two. Um, I'm getting BC vibes from them last year when I, I picked P- I picked BC to make tournament. In our show, in our January first show last year, and I believe after that they lost or they didn't win in ten games after I picked <laughs> them to get the tournament. Wondering if that's going to be the case with either Providence, either Providence or UMass is on a losing streak since I jinxed them. Um, those no. those picks are not looking so hot. So. Yeah, well, we've got some movement and things are shaking up. It's an interesting time of year. Yep. And especially, you know, I'm excited to kind of see how this bit kind of goes throughout the next, you know, obviously, you know, for the rest of the season. Uh, Because I guess my thought process is like, you're top 10, you're fine. You know, at this point, like, like in which the data will tell you is a fairly good bet. Like I think but 90% man, of the teams is or, yeah. at, at January 1st in the top 10 have made the tournament the last 10 years plus or something like that. So but history will Mac agree and, with you. Seeing Miramac in Connecticut. I mean, obviously I know they're not powerhouses and they're, you know, or, you know, you're not the traditional blue buds of college hockey, but you know, we were, we were there once too. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but, you know, just seeing them drop as much as they have um, after one bad weekend. I mean, really, Connecticut sitting at 14, that, that that's probably not going to get you there in the tournament sitting at 14. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's right on the bubble. It's, yeah, it's, it's it's still it still is you know, early enough where there are bigger movements than you would think. Mm-hmm. You know, like what was North Dakota coming into this weekend? They they gained three or four spots with their sweated out to the last minute sweep against oh, Lindenwood. Lindenwood, getting down two goals in in both of those games. I they guess with those results, 18, eighteen to sixteen, they went up two. Okay, mm-hmm. which I guess makes sense. But I mean, so they go up two, sweeping a terrible Lindenwood team, and Alaska splits at Denver, and they don't move up at all like that doesn't make sense to me but again we're still a little early in the pairwise it still is a little goofy um but we're we're, we're far enough into pairwise where like i said the top 10 teams are in pretty good shape but it's just that 10 to 16 10 to 20 let's say there's going to be a lot of movement in there and mm-hmm. and so yeah i guess yeah <laughs> so the two to nothing leads for lindenwood and i guess we can lump in the U S being up to rip to Canada and then losing. <laughs> this was a good week for Kevin Gorg because yeah, his right? whole, uh, you want to be, you know, zero, zero, zero rather zero. than two rip, uh, worst lead in hockey. And it really showed this week, uh, in, in multiple results. So, yeah. um, and looking at some of the data too, that didn't help Alaska. They did go from 22 to 21. So I guess progress. Okay. 
Um, but you know, above them, you know, BC, Minnesota State, solid weekend. Uh, North Dakota, solid weekend. Connecticut wasn't going to drop that far. Michigan Tech obviously had a really big jump. So I mean, the there were. I think it was more of a product of not quite enough teams falling out versus them not doing enough to jumping up. And you got these. You got these. This Big Ten. These Big Ten teams wearing their strength of schedule armor right now. Yeah. You know, like Michigan State, another two losses, including I think a six nothing loss hands of Ohio State. So that's seven out of eight losses for them. Uh, and they only dropped to 15. Uh, I think they only dropped one or two points or one or two slots. And Notre Dame, two slots, splitting, yeah. splitting at Wisconsin. Notre Dame's uh, right at 500, 10, 10, and 2. They have had one, more than one game winning streak this whole year. They've won three games in a row in October. Other than that, their longest winning streak is one all season. But they're there at 17 because their strength of schedule looks really sexy because they play the Big Ten, which is really good this year. So you got this 500, just mediocre, average, blah, Notre Dame team hanging around way higher than they need to be. Um, So, again, they can they can wear that sort of strength of schedule uh, as as a badge of honor and uh, and be higher than they should be. Thanks, but Penn it, State. Thanks, Penn State. <laughs> so, um, oh, other uh, games kind of going around uh, college hockey here this weekend. A uh, full slate of conference games. Um, mm-hmm. So we've got Miami at Denver, Western Michigan at North Dakota. That'll be a fun series to keep your eye on. Minnesota Duluth at Omaha. And I'm really excited to see kind of what teams show up there. Um, yeah. Duluth somehow found some offense, um, which they have um, been missing, obviously, all year. Omaha, flip a coin, what they're going to do. Um, they're such a complete wild card. So, um, but obviously, I'm going to be I'm going to be kind of tuning into that Western Michigan, North Dakota. I think that, um, you know, I hope it doesn't end up the same as their first match when, you know, we had Western Michigan and their top line. North Dakota not being able to keep the puck out of the net and they end up, you know, having a really tight defensive battle. <laughs> so, and if you were a North Dakota fan coming out of that series, at least saying, Hey, maybe we finally figured out who our goalie's going to be. DeRitter, who had a great weekend in Kalamazoo. Well, he lasts <laughs> all of six shots on Friday against <laughs> Lindenwood, giving up three of them. Three of them, yeah. Helston takes over for the rest of the weekend. So now you're throwing your hands up in the air and say, Hey, who the hell is our goalie now? Is it, I'm assuming Helston will start on Friday for them because he's the hot hand, <laughs> but maybe you go back with DeRitter because he, he has the Western Michigan. He's like the Dan Dunn uh, effect. Like he's got Western's numbers. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. At this point say, yeah, if you thought you solved your goal, goalie issues, not so fast. God, double D Dan Dunn. He was North Dakota kryptonite. Uh, Mike Lee still has bad Mike, dreams about about North Dakota. Yeah, Mike Mike Lee and Mike Lee. I don't think he he never beat North Dakota, right? I don't think he did. I can't remember. I can't so. remember time, and I remember eight to one games that that he was pulled from. So, yeah, he did not have the best of success against the team from Grand Forks. Mm-hmm. But yeah, and then. Duluth too, as you you mentioned, you know, came within fifty seconds or so of getting shut out at Bemidji on Friday, uh, but getting a tying goal there late, extra attacker, um, maybe it was like a minute and a half. It, it was still it was the extra attacker goal and salvaging a tie in Bemidji, and then coming back home and and popping five in on Bemidji on Saturday. And yeah, if you're We've been waiting all year for Duluth to, to wake up, especially offensively. Maybe that's what, maybe that's what will uh, you know help cure them of those offensive woes. Uh, and we'll see how they play against uh, in Omaha, which as you said, just such a weird team that you can't figure out. And then yeah, Denver and Miami. I mean, Denver hasn't been really blowing me away lately. You know, they ha- they had their own struggles against Lindenwood when they played them, at least the second game was a tight one. And then I did catch the end of that game against uh, Alaska. Uh, 
they got off the mat on Saturday, scoring seven goals on a, on a hot Alaska goalie. Um, so they're still obviously a, a team to, to reckon with, but, uh, and they should, I don't think they should, they're going to have any much problems with Miami at home this weekend, but still, I, I don't think this is quite the level of team that Denver had last year. Obviously that's not going out on too much. of is not, not too much better. You can do than winning the national title, but, uh, but I think Allegedly. they, you know, they're, they're beatable. Um, well, this reminds me, you know, I, I want to fact check myself. Last week I mentioned Hobie Baker winners and uh, Hobie Baker winners who did not play for a team that made the NCAA tournament. I was going through the list kind of on the fly. And when I popped, a, when I went across Matt Carl's name, 05, 06, I just figured that was one of their back to back national titles. But no, that was 04 and 05 oh. were those two titles. And the 05 06 Denver team did not make the tournament. So Matt Carl is actually the last player to win the Hobie for a non NCAA tournament winning team. There's only been three. I did the full list. There's only been three. And players. you fact checked. So don't lie I, to me. I did fact check this. <laughs> three players who have won the Hobie and have not made the tournament. Carl, Brian Holzinger, who I mentioned last weekend from Bowling Green. The third one. Junior Lassard. O- nope. He's the only player to win it for a losing team. I will pay your mortgage payment for a month. Ooh. If you tell you're not looking at the list, are you? Nope. You get even one if guess. I looked at even if I looked guess. at the list. Oh, geez. For a they losing were, team. They were, and they weren't even close to being a winning team. They were 14, 21, and 3. So, a pretty bad team. But do you have a guess as to this, which I think is a pretty interesting trivia question? Interesting. Um, how about you- half my mortgage payment, but you give me a hint? <laughs> Uh, I, I I don't want to give you the team. Uh, okay, um, I mean that's fair. Um, um, I'm gonna go. I don't know how with... good. I don't know how well you know this list of Hobie winners. I mean, yeah, there's some that just kind of stick out in my head, but like everybody that sticks out in my head, it was like they had to have been on a good team. But I think of like maybe like some asterisk or not like asterisk winner, but it's like all right, hundred bucks. I'll give you a hundred bucks. I'll give you the okay. year. The year. Ninety three, okay. ni- ninety three, ninety four. Oh geez, okay, we're going back. Ninety three, ninety four. If I'm offering to pay your mortgage, I'm <laughs> assuming you are not very familiar with this player. I mean, it's yeah. obscure. It, it's obscure. Okay, so like I, I'm thinking. I mean, obviously, it can't be Korea. No, nope. because I mean that was Maine. I mean, right. Maine was. I mean, they it, were incredibly forty-two good. and one. Yeah, Holsinger was around that time, right? It was been the year before Holsinger, so back-to-back oh. years. They okay. uh, Hobie was from a non NCAA team. I think. Brian Bonin. That's my guess. Nope. He was you're a right, Hobie. You're in the right time. Yep. That was the year after Holzinger. He won in 95, oh, 96. Okay. 93, 94 winner, Chris Marinucci from Minnesota Duluth. Duluth. Oh. <laughs> and 93, 94 Duluth. Guess who's on that team other than Chris Marinucci? Brett Larson. Brett Larson. I had to do some digging there because. I'm like, why, why, why? Like, again, if he's the only guy to win it for a losing team, there had to have been some reason. He, and I'm thinking, okay, maybe he was just the leading scorer in the country. Nope. He was like ninth nationwide in scoring. He had 61 points, which is a good, you know, a good year, but not a great year. And it wasn't even a great year among 93, 94 scorers 
And so I'm just baffled as to why he won this award. Duluth was really good the year before um, the 92-93 season. They won the McNaughton, which is the last time they have won a conference, regular season conference title. And that was a very sort of of out-of-the-blue title for them. Uh, They hadn't made the tournament since their run with, like, Bill Watson and, like, the Brett Hull, that sort of run, Curvers, in the mid-'80s. They hadn't made the tournament, and it had been pretty bad for seven, eight years, and then they won it sort of out of the blue in that 92-93 year. And Marinucci had a good year, but he wasn't even the best player on that team. That would have been Derek Plant. He had, like, a 90-point season for them that year so it's not even like he won it the year after and so like the oscar winner wins it for a lesser performance but they just got beat out by a better performance the year prior i'm just chalking it up to 94 was just a weird sports year this was like the year of the mlb the mlb and nhl had strikes that year um just and in college hockey land. So Maine would have won the tournament in 93, 94. They had a academic scandal. They had to forfeit a bunch of their games. Um, and so that sort of tainted them. The winner of the tournament that year was Lake state. Uh, sort of their last gasp as a powerhouse, uh, in college hockey. And they didn't have like, they, they had a, they had a really good goalie, Blaine Locker, who I came across that name because he had a shutout streak, like five or six games in a row. And that came up a few years ago when there was a Northern Michigan goalie that had a, a shutout streak that was close to passing it. I don't think he did pass it, but but Locker had a really good year for Lake State, but he didn't become the starter until fairly late in the season. I think he only played three quarters of the game, so he wasn't a Hobie candidate he didn't even get like second team ccha goalie of the year honors and so there was just no obvious can and i think there was a dip in scoring too you had guys like korea the year before having 100 point seasons a handful of guys having 90 point seasons the leading score in 94 was like 70 points so there was like a we're getting into the mid 90s dip in scoring in in hockey like with the the devils and the trap and la mer and stuff so maybe that had a bit of a factor in limiting offense a little bit just a weird year i i don't quite get why he won it but that's a good trivia question to bring up to your college hockey friends the only hobie baker winner to win it on a losing team chris marinucci i know that was a severe tangent but it was on my mind. I was on a no, no, big no, sort of really- binge. I also was on like a rabbit hole on YouTube. I was not familiar. There was something there. I came across, stumbled across this program called College Hockey USA. Google that or, or YouTube it because it was like a baseball tonight style, like highlight uh, show hosted okay. by hosted by Jim Rich. And Frank Mazzacco, who I, I saw episodes from 88 to 95, and then a couple in between. There was like five episodes total that I saw on YouTube. And they, on one of these, they announced it as College Hockey USA brought to you by Prime TV. I have no idea what that is, but I'm guessing it was some sort of syndicated thing that you'd get in specific college hockey markets because they were they would do things you know because they're minnesota guys they would have highlights of like the wcha but then they also had a segment of like hockey east highlights and they had like a segment with bob kurtz when he was doing boston university games him talking about bu um so they were trying to do it as like a nationwide or at least you know doing an east and a west kind of focus uh, but I was pretty fascinated by it, and I was kind of impressed by the uh, by the production value. And I was like, I, we need this today. Like, we need we need a College Hockey USA show on e- ESPN Plus or something. Just give me something where there's a bunch of highlights, all condensed. They give you the standings. They give you the the us chill poll. They give you the pairwise. They give you the national scoring leaders. All that jazz. A young Jim Rich, 
uh, a young Frank Mazzacco. I had it. I had overtime rules stuff. that make sense. <laughs> yeah, he seemed to be quite on top of, of of everything too. So I was quite impressed. And so, if you want to fall down a fun rabbit hole, Google uh, college hockey USA and have some fun. Interesting. I'll definitely check that out. Um, you know, kind of as we wrap up here, uh, a couple of questions. Um, you know, kind of the big one, Dan Jacobson did ask, um, a, a little yeah. bit of news and I was a little bit confused on the news. Uh, I didn't know if they were, if they were, were meant to come out at the same time or if they were different publications or, or what it was, but there was reports that, um, just no, you know, Illinois, Illinois is not going D1 hockey. Sorry no, to they're burst really close. They're really close. They're really <laughs> close. Um, that there was going to be, uh, or they have put forth a proposal for a college hockey version of the NIT. Um, whereas if you don't make the national tournament, you still get postseason um, uh, tournament of, of of the invitation. And then there was another one that um, the NCAA is asking or wondering or pushing or something along the lines of a 30 or a, of if you have less than 200 teams, 50% should make the postseason. So that obviously would affect college hockey, um, men's college hockey. That would be a 32 team um, or, you know, I guess 30, uh, but it would be. Um, probably a 32 team tournament um, as well. So Dan Jacobson wanted our uh, kind of opinions when it comes to that. He did also make a quip that St. Cloud could be the first team to lose to a 32 seed. Um, and I thought that was tough. We, we deserve that. We deserve that. <laughs> so, um, but uh, just um, either one of those kind of, what's your thoughts? Well, yeah, the, the 32 team field isn't, that's not 16 teams too many. That's 20 teams too many. If you ask me, we've been over that. I, I think Especially 16 is too many. Um, yeah, I, I would hate that. If, if the only way I would like it is if like those bottom 16 of the 32, they're in some sort of play in tournament to the real one, like. You still you need to make it a lot harder to win a, a national title, especially if you're a 32nd team, which is bottom half of the country. 61 teams right now, so 32 would be a below average team. You can't have them just have the same, like they win the same number, they play and win the same number of games as I the might, number one overall seed. That's terrible. If, if you're gonna make I it, might, work, they have to win eight games, and the number one overall seed gets a bunch of buys, and they only need to win four games fine i still would hate it but that would be less hateable um but i i, I don't like it i really hate to bit. bring this up but do you know who the 32 in the pairwise is right now god is it aic <laughs> nope oh, ferris. ferris f and state ferris f and damn it state. well we wouldn't get them <laughs> go that'd be the gophers that'd be Moscow's problem um which not, i guess not, not great not great bob <laughs> not um, great bob <laughs> Uh, so yeah i i what what do you think about uh 32 team field i mean if i mean anything honestly at this point anything that gets us to neutral or away from neutral sites um is going to be a win in my book even if it is 32 teams but if we get it on campus and in front of atmosphere i think that would just do wonders for the game I, I think I think that's what's really sorely lacking in the NCAA tournament, and that's the change that needs to happen. Um, Thirty-two, obviously, it's it's a lot, and I mean we're looking at you know some of these teams down here: Niagara, Lowell, RIT, Minnesota Duluth would make it. Yeah. So the I mean, you got a Chris handful Marinucci. of handful of under five hundred teams would make it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you would apply the Wisconsin rule to those <laughs> yeah, teams at that point. The maybe, Wisconsin rule maybe would probably you, be expand it to have thirty-two. To be dead. Then you'd yeah. you'd have to apply. You no, know, they'd give them a finally give them a chance to apply the Wisconsin rule because they've never had to do that. Mm. Or, your... or 
You you just treat it like a bowl game, whereas you just win percentage, just the top two to thirty two, just throw out the pairwise in general. Doesn't matter. It's just as long as you got a win percentage uh, that is in the top thirty two, that's your pairwise ranking, or that's your new ranking. That actually, I don't really hate if we do this route. I like your your. But good, oh, but good God, you you know that you know that Penn State would just uh they would just take advantage of that. It would just pay, play Atlantic hockey 32 times and be like, yep, we're good. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. If it would kill the Big Ten hockey conference, I'd be all for that. <laughs> um, your rationale of, of getting things on campus, that's why I'm in favor of this NIT, which the first, my first reaction, which I think is the you know conventional wisdom reaction, is HA! That was my first reaction of, of hearing about an NIT. But then the details were that they would all be on campus sites. Mm-hmm. And there were some really stupid ideas, like they would have the first round play the same weekend as the NCAA tournament. Like going like having these NIT games against tournament games. That's a terrible idea. You'd have to put it, just put them like in a Monday or Tuesday. Do, do not put them against the NCAA tournament. But beyond that, so you, you still have to work out some of the kinks. But let's just say, like, North Dakota, who wouldn't make the tournament right now, they would perhaps host one of these NIT games. What I would like is North Dakota, let's say, um, you know, or like a Notre Dame, something like that. But let's just use North Dakota. They're a good example. Um, they outdraw the... Manchester Regional um, as a as a, a home conf- or a home like campus site NIT draw outdraws uh, the NCAA tournament. Yeah. What I want, what there. I want, yes, what I want is, and I know there's going to be some North Dakota fans that are going to scoff at the idea of playing in this NIT, but. You're telling me that North Dakota fans got a chance to drink beer and yell Sue for two hours, that they're not going to show at least 10,000 aren't going to show up for that. They will. Um, they will. And so, yeah, they draw 10,000. I'd be hard pressed not to show up. Postseason I mean, that... game. And then Albany has got 2000 fans and that's paid attendance. That's not butts in the seats, you know, with a regional final with a frozen four trip on the line. What I want is campus sites for the NCAA tournament. What you, they don't seem to be in any hurry to do that. How that happens is if you embarrass them on a scale like this to have a meaningless NIT you're tournament going, out, you're going out draw big brain the NCAAs. This, yeah. is, this is big brain I think the actual, the actual tournament itself, I mean, again, if it was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, if it was like those first-round games were not going against the NCAA tournament, I'd probably watch the games. What what else am I going to be doing on those days? I'll watch the games. Mm-hmm. They're meaningless tournaments. Yeah. We will laugh at whoever wins this thing and raises a banner for it. That will be a laugh <laughs> worthy. Like will Omaha, <laughs> Omaha would do it. Yeah, I, I would say maybe maybe we have more pride than that, but uh, no, I can't I can't imagine North Dakota would. Uh, it'd be funny though. The first to do that, I, I give their <laughs> athletic department props. Um, for, for making that banner, but it's it's hockey, and it, you know if you're you know if, let's say Saint Cloud makes it one of these years, and they play like a Michigan State or you know a team that they've never played before, like it'd be kind of fun. I don't know, it'd, it'd be worthless, it'd be useless. But if it, I mean, if you're going to give me an opportunity to watch another Saint Cloud game versus not watching another Saint Cloud game that season, sure, I'll watch it. What's I'm, it's not like I'm going to protest and not watch the NIT. Yeah, whatever. It's it's not going to be the same, obviously, as the NCAA tournament. But as long as it's not competing for time slots against the NCAA tournament, which I think would just be a dumb idea. Mm-hmm. Why not? And um, and I think they said I, that the championship game would also be on that Friday. That's in between the Frozen Four. Well, that's which so would they were be saying a that wonderful spot. Well, so I was trying to think of that. So they they said that they would play the first round the same weekend that the NCAA tournament regionals are played. Then they would play the semifinals in the, the, the following weekend, which is an off weekend. No, there's an off weekend between that and the, and the Frozen Four. So you play the semifinals there, and then you play the final 
and the Friday between the Frozen Four games. Frozen Four games, obviously, on Thursday and Saturday. I think you just, you take that free week, you, you bump, you put the first round, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, after the regionals, and then you play the semifinals, like, Friday, Saturday, Sunday of that weekend, and then you play that championship game on the Friday between the Frozen Four. I, I, I think you can make it work. Uh, just, you, you can't go against the NCAA, NCAA tournament, I think. And, again, there's, there's issues as far as this uh, company who is proposing this idea they're going to be asking the teams like North Dakota and like big 10 teams that don't make it. They're going to be asking them to host. You're not going to really have much of a fair bracket. I don't think as far as how they seed the teams and who's getting home games. Like, you know, if you're going to have like your second place Atlantic hockey team playing this thing, I don't think they're ever going to get a home game really. And is that fair? Yeah. Probably not, but they're trying to make money here. And it would be smart for them to go to teams that have a chance to draw. I mean, they even mentioned in this article, like these teams that would bid for the chance to host these games would have to be dumping 20, 30,000 for like the quarterfinals. And then like 40,000 for the, for the final game. Mm -hmm. Not every team is going to volunteer to do that. But like I said, North Dakota can make a profit based on that. Um, And Several teams can do that, yeah. But don't don't look at it as far as like this is. We're really trying to figure out a a great champion among the teams that didn't make it. I I, I don't think that's really the main thing. I just want the NCAA the NCAA to be embarrassed and be outdrawn by a meaningless postseason tournament, and that would perhaps force their hand because nothing else is forcing their hand to go to campus sites at this point. They're doubling and tripling, quadrupling down on a bad idea that's been a bad idea for about 30 years now. So something needs to give. This could be the impetus to force that change. So that's why I'm surprisingly all in favor of the NIT. Hmm. A little bit of schadenfreude there, but uh, you, you kind of con- you're kind of convincing me on this. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, 30,000 to uh, host the quarterfinal, 30,000 to host the semifinal, 40,000 to host the championship game, and road teams would be getting a travel stipend between five and 20,000. Um, you know, one of the big kind of question marks about it is, you know, college basketball, f- college football, whatnot, they all have, you know, the drafts afterwards. These players are, some of them are drafted. So what is going to be the bigger draw for some of these um, players? Um, Is it going to be, you know, being in this NIT team or potentially signing an entry-level deal if they're not going to make the NCAA tournament? Is that going to hurt the talent pool too much where it's not going to be worth it or um, other teams aren't going to be really interested in competing because, you know, maybe someone like North Dakota, they did lose five or six guys going to the pros that – you know, so yeah, there's those types of aspects too. But at the same time, get some of the people that don't get a lot of playing time, a little bit of extra tournament experience. Eh, maybe that's not that bad of an idea. Yeah, that was mentioned in that Rink Live piece by by Schlossman as well. Is that this might you know team you know players might bolt after the after their NCAA hopes, but at the same are time. Dashed college football a lot of people who they, they declare for the draft they they'll skip out on bowl games so i sure. guess it's not that You're, much different. yeah that that might happen um but again if you are going to time this where it is going to end the day before the frozen four does i don't think that's really going to screw too much with like transfer portal timing because well i do think that some guys have made that announcement in between like during the NCAA tournament time because you still have teams playing throughout the frozen four that really doesn't start to heat up until after the frozen four is done. So as long as this tournament is, is, is also done right around that same time, I don't think that is going to really affect the transfer portal action too much. You are, you are going to get guys that are going to bolt and go to the NHL. Um, 
that's fine. I don't think that's unreasonable for them to pick the N- an NHL contract rather than playing two, one, two, or three games in an NIT tournament. Um, but you might have some fringe guys, you know, senior type guys that maybe could use another two or three games, you know, and especially if these games are going to be played in isolation, you know, not against any other college games. Mm-hmm. Maybe this gives them somewhat of a platform to make one last sort of difference to scouts. Maybe that's a pipe dream to think that this could or be a springboard, but maybe, it could work both ways. Maybe a little bit different, not a springboard though to the pros, but springboard into the transfer portal. Springboard, um, exactly. There where, you go. Whereas, yeah. like, you know, then all of a sudden somebody's on your radar, they have, you know, two goal game three point game something like that yeah or um, it's like the the guys that bolt to the crazy. nhl the guys that bolt to the nhl now you're suiting up guys that have been benched all year mm-hmm. you give them a couple of games and maybe they go hey i i don't need this uh you know i don't need to be parked on the bench here in north dakota maybe i can bolt for one of these other teams that's going to offer me another spot because i got this opportunity to showcase my talents here uh Again, you can imagine a, that North Dakota won in the NIT tournament. So, uh, yeah, that uh, would be fun. it. Would be fun, um, but yeah, I am. Uh, I am all for it. Um, I don't. I, I'm glad that this came up, and because it's not just a hey, maybe this would be a decent idea for someone to do. Because it's the story is because this certain company is proposing this and has these certain particulars, like the, the money that you mentioned, the, you know, host teams would need to plop down 40 grand for, you know, to host these games makes me believe that this is not just a idea. This is actually being tossed around. It could be a possibility. I mean, they mentioned in the article that this might happen this year. So, um, like I said, I just, I wish that they don't go against tournament NCAA tournament games. I think that'd be stupid. And it might that the, see the downside, like my, my ideal situation is that this embarrasses the NCAA and forces them to go in, you know, to, to do campus sites for the NCAA tournament. There is the possibility that this backfires, you know, and uh, you get some, some hosts and they decide to play them against the NCAA tournament games and not many people show up and those host schools lose money and then no one wants to host and it fails after a year of face plans. That's certainly a possibility. Making money in college hockey has been a tough sledding uh, for the last few years. Uh, yeah. And it's no sure bet. And But, you know, this company that's that's proposing this, they're the ones that have been putting on the Wisconsin holiday tournament the last couple of years. I don't know how well that's been going. I haven't seen, like, any attendance figures or, or whatnot. But, I mean, they've already announced the field for next year, Duluth to be in it i know i can't remember who else but northeastern i think um but uh and air force actually i do know all four of those teams so i mean they're actually they're <laughs> they're, make, they're making a they're making a, a multi-year run uh coordinating a, a mid-season tournament um and so they obviously know a little bit of what they're doing so it's certainly a more than just a throwing spaghetti against the wall and, and see what this, how this idea goes. It sounds like this is more in the, we might actually do this and we might actually reach out to teams. I, I think there is some logistical issues too, as far as this would also give the people that for, for the people that say that you can't do campus sites. Um, this would either give them the evidence that belies their point, or it would reinforce their concern of, the thing is, you can't do these campus sites with a week in advance. You know, like you don't know what the field is prior to, you know, the Sunday selection Sunday. And then you got the game starting on Thursday and Friday. Well, that's four days and we can't have you know hotels and we book our concerts so well in advance. And we can't we can't just reserve this for hockey that might happen or not. This would give those that crowd either fodder or evidence that proves that they're wrong because this would be a sort of on the fly. We're giving you a week in advance to set everything up. This would give them that opportunity or is this would require these host schools to do that. So again, maybe that backfires, but maybe it proves to work out just fine. So I just want, I want the, 
I want the data. I want a, a test run and see how this works because if it goes test by it, with season. flying colors, then the NCAA then the NCAA would have no reason to just continue to do this this failed system that they've been doing for so long. So again, I, I'm all for it. Um, you know, just uh, you know, when I was talking about the thirty, thirty, forty thousand uh dollars, you know. The host teams obviously would get the revenue from the tickets, media, sponsorships, um, concessions, et cetera, et cetera, concessions, um, which, you know, obviously you, you don't, as far as I know, you don't get for the NCAA tournament because right. that all goes to the NCAA. So, I mean, there is that aspect of it, too. Um, I know this is a long podcast, but since this is just kind of an interesting um, uh, topic, I'll I'll just put it okay. So North Dakota sitting at sixteen, so seventeen on down. W- which teams would you watch in a tournament? I gotta fire up the pairwise here. So I'm thinking, you know, you could have like you know. I mean, the, again, the next... y- you're talking to someone that just uh, watched Air Force and BU at three <laughs> thirty on a Friday and drove two hours each way to do it. So. Nothing's off I mean, limits, right? I'm not really going to clear out my schedule to watch a Bemidji game, necessarily. But, yeah, I mean. But N- Notre Dame. I mean, against, Notre Dame uh, doesn't Boston really do College. much. Sure. Catholic. Providence, uh, Minnesota Catholic State. on Catholic. Sure. <laughs> Catholic crime. Alaska's a cute team. I, you know I like UMass. Omaha. Um, <laughs> Omaha, who's raising Arizona that banner. State. R-I-T, R-I-T in the N-I-T. It's a natural word play there. I've decided Arizona State, after what they have on the wall, too, about their NCAA tournament win over uh, Michigan Tech, that um, uh, the wall's doing, or the <laughs> Go Huskies will pointed out that uh, that's not exactly correct. What happened? But, uh um so on uh, i'll pull it up here quickly um on the they were Arizona's, claiming that they beat michigan state or michigan tech well in the game that N- they lost they have ncaa tournament but tournament is with a lowercase t so it's not the actual tournament so basically what it says on the wall is just an ncaa you know tournament lowercase t win they're just referencing they won an ncaa tournament and it was their first ncaa tournament win against michigan tech in like the las vegas or you know tournament that they were in like in january of 2018 or something like that oh so it's 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 like uh that Goskis will point out that the word tournament there is doing a lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's creative. That's uh, <laughs> creative I don't, is totally. That's pretty. Hey, hey, we're talking about teams that would raise banners for winning the NIT. I think Arizona State rose to the top of the heap there with with <laughs> that. That's that's raising so, the bar uh, on their yep yeah, on their walls. So it says. On January 7th, 2018, ASU captured its first NCAA tournament win, so lowercase t for tournament win, in a 3-2 to two victory over Michigan Technological University in the championship game of Ice Vegas at T-Mobile Wait, Arena. How did they get Las their Vegas. first how did they get their first NCAA lowercase t tournament win in the championship game of a tournament? Because they would have had to have won that it, game to get there. But they're the NCAA tournament as a whole. So our first championship in an NCAA tournament. I'm surprised they're tournament, not... not the tournament, not the NCAA. Tournament. Well, if they're <laughs> so using it's... that as a criteria, why don't they pick their club team national championships then? I think it those says NC because it says on the bottom, it's the NCAA era. <laughs> So in the uh, NCAA era, this is their first NCAA tournament win. I am seriously so, regretting giving that <laughs> university some money this this season um, based on that. I've yeah, been to a few games. So. 
And say maybe they would host one of these NIT tournament games and have it. I, I, I might go up there. I mean, part of the reason I went to this tournament was because I was able to scratch off Air Force. I'm trying to find, I'm trying to go to all, trying to go to a game featuring every college hockey team. I still got like 20 teams to go, and I had never seen Air Force in person. So that's like one of the reasons that I went oh, that's this weekend cool. is that I was able to, they were the only one of the three that I hadn't seen. Um, but yeah, if they were playing Bowling Green, let's say a team that I also have never seen in person, I might go. Um, but, uh, not based on that information they just gave me, but yeah, I mean, it's an easy sell for me. Uh, I think the, the more, the, the biggest question is, yeah, would, you know, would fair seven state, would they bid on something like this to host, uh, one of these tournament games? Probably not. Like, would, I'm just saying, like, these Atlantic hockey teams, I think it'd be a tough go for them. Omaha, I think, would be a perfect one. Like, you're saying that they got, like, 7,000 over Christmas for that yeah. series against St. Lawrence. I mean, they can, if you're, if you're doing 20 bucks a throw, you know, at, at you're getting 5,000 fans, that's 100,000 right there, by my math. I think that's right. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you're not, this isn't maybe cash cow situation, but... Again, you're giving these these clubs an opportunity to make a little extra money that they weren't budgeting at the beginning of the year. The, what the one thing this might be crazy, but let's say you're a team that's like 15 in pairwise, and you might sneak in. There's going to be a team that's going to be like, you know what? Maybe we should lose in order for us to get another. We can host a game in the NIT and get more revenue rather than going to the wow. NCAA tournament. <laughs> not getting any money and probably losing in the first game. I hope there's no program that actually would think that, but, um, <laughs> capitalism, baby. <laughs> I love that. I just <laughs> love the idea of the athletic director going to the coach and being like, Hey, we need the gate for the NIT. Lose this and s- lose this next game. And the coach, make it, like, make you got a good point. Good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Earn, earn your bonus. So, um, uh, Zamora, Eric Zamora, how did Saturday's atmosphere compare to the better atmospheres of the past five to ten years um, and when you first started going to SESU games? Obviously, like when I first started going to SESU games, I mean, in that early 2000s, that was really a heyday of, of college hockey where, um, you know, some of the some of the af- uh, atmosphere was just off the charts for just random games. I mean. Um, you know, you'd have Alaska Anchorage and it'd be a near sellout. So it's obviously it's, it's different times as far as the last five to 10 years. It's, it's definitely up there. Um, like I said, you know, probably a little bit hampered by the fact there wasn't more goals scored. It wasn't back and forth tilt on Saturday. So, um, but at the same time, it was tense the whole time. You could like tell people were trying to, you know, wait for something to happen so it was exciting maybe in a little bit of a different way um than i expected but you know really top-notch atmosphere for um you know the last five to ten years uh especially um and you know up there was you know some of the the good atmospheres over over my the course of my career and it's always something you know i don't think it quite was as good as like when you know the gophers um you know in in the Oh six, oh seven, oh eight. You know, and I had like the the, the Lash Row era, Nodal. You know that that was kind of a special place. You know, maybe that's my nostalgia and age kind of talking there a little bit more. But, um, yeah, it was still. I mean, top night notch atmosphere, and it's a bummer that this these games aren't going to be on the schedule for the foreseeable future. Yeah, that's right. I guess you know saw that uh, you know Matsko talk the talk at least. Um, he, giving he made his, a couple, he giving made a couple of points, which was interesting. Like he, like, like, were we? Like, was our chatter online kind of getting to Bob a little bit? He didn't seem like a Twitter scroller to me, but you know, there was a lot of Husky fans that were definitely, you know, upset about him uh, skipping this well, s- this game for the foreseeable future. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, well, you see the results. I mean, sellout crowd at St. Cloud. 10,000 plus was the was the reported attendance in Mariucci. I'm sure butts and seats weren't quite that high, but 
third largest attendance this year, uh, other than the North Dakota games, another former, mm-hmm. you know, conference rival uh, that that uh, isn't going to be on every year's non-conference schedule. You know, he puffed his chest out about, you know, hey, I've been here five years and we've scheduled St. Cloud three times. Soon that's going to be three out of seven years. Um, yeah. So that that percentage isn't going to be as high. Yeah, but you know, like I said, talk the talk, saying about how much he feels it's important to schedule these games. He's just got to commit to that, actually do it now. And, and like I said, he's going to be taking a couple of years off here. So I, I and like I said, I, I don't know if it's reasonable to expect that these games should be on every season. I'm thinking like two out of every three years, though. I mean, you, it's reasonable to take a year off there. Like be, it's for, especially from the Gophers perspective, you got five other teams in Minnesota and then you got North Dakota. If you're playing two game series against every one of them, that's 12 games. You, you only got 10 games in your non-conference schedule. So someone's got to be left off every year. And even if that, then you have no room for anybody else, which I don't think is reasonable for, for someone to expect. So like I said, two out of every three years, give me two out of every three years. And you can cycle through your other in-state rivals at that point. I mean, he's saying, he's like, I love, you know, he's talking about St. Thomas being on the schedule because he likes having a bus ride trip. Like, dude, you you can get to St. Cloud with the bus, you realize. (laughs) Right. You hate taking a really nice road trip for us. Talking about wanting to make a quick road trip. um, There was a school that you're kind of familiar with that fits that criteria. So... Yeah, I hope that um, I hope that they are able to come to an agreement here and uh, get him back on on the on a down the schedule on a regular basis because we saw this weekend how much it means for both schools and both fan bases. Uh, it's uh, important to keep these rivalries fresh. Um, is uh, Eric uh, asked? Is this the staunchest defensive Huskies team that you can remember? Almost no space uh, to the Gophers other than along the boards, and it gave him uh, UMD the last five years vibes. Um, so as far as the staunchest defensive team, yeah, especially with how we played. Um, and, you know, I, I look at, like, some of the, you know, Ashan years, Schultz and whatnot that we had in Jensen you know, they, they were kind of dominant defensemen, but definitely in a different way. Um, you know, this one is, you know, a lot more of that lockdown type. You know, I'm not too worried that things are going to kind of go off the rails. I, I, I trust this squad a little bit more. And I'm, I'm in, in agreement there that it is probably the staunchiest uh, defensive core that we've had in my history i would say even as a st cloud state fan yeah it's different like the those late aughts teams um which were fine teams i mean we made a couple of tournaments in that era but there would be a lot of times fletcher and stevenson and <laughs> there'd be games they were playing against like north go to the gophers where you know it would be like a 40 to 20 shot advantage for the opponent mm-hmm. but because you're relying on gefford and you know, was Lasky when his good year and, and Lee had done when they were playing well, those kind of goalies. I feel like the they didn't have the offense there and were reliant on the defense to carry the day and win two to one, three, three to two type games. Whereas I don't feel like I mean, like I said, they were able to limit the shots here this weekend against the Gophers. Like it's it's a different type of defensive structure here than what uh than what those teams, if we're trying to look back historically, um so it's a little bit different in that regard. Uh, and But again, I'm getting back to that. What I said at the beginning is like, what is this? I don't, I don't think of this team as a defense first team, but perhaps I should. I, I, I feel more like it's, it's a, uh, like I feel like the international line is kind of the identity of this team or, or, or has been for the last few years, that type of player. I mean, we know we've had like the Finn finish connection for a while now, even dating back to, you know, Gibbons obviously was the guy that was in on that mostly, but, uh, but perhaps this is the team. And we, we saw when they made the title game run, you know, they play a lot different style in the tournament that year than they did during the regular season. So, th- 
And I think that was kind of a game plan for the tournament itself. Larson coming from Duluth, you know, question, questioner mentioned that this meant that this reminded him of those Duluth teams. I don't think that's a, a, a fluke because, you know, the guy yeah. in charge had a lot of, had a lot to do with some of those Duluth teams. So especially their, their tournament runs and playing such, such tight defense there. So I don't think that's a, um, uh, I, I think that's a good observation. And um, we'll see if that's kind of how this team sort of settles in. We've been praising the defense all year, but it's more been, you know, like guys like how, how great Anhorn's playing offensively, leading the country and scoring uh, from the point. He had a really good weekend this weekend from a defensive standpoint, I thought. And uh, Oh, yeah, he did. And so if that's uh, going to be the recipe, you know, it's you don't need a ton of offense to carry you at that point. You can win more lower scoring games. And if the goalies again, if the goalies are going to play this well, too, that's going to keep you in games, too. So I, I don't know if it is the stingiest of all time for St. Cloud, or at least going back to our history with the team. But um, this was a really good weekend in, the, in, in that category. So, um, uh, again, uh, I mean, more sit, of that sitting is. right now for goals against per game right now, we're at 1.94 goals against. Yep. I mean, that's. That's you know, not bad. That, that's pretty stingy. <laughs> so. Um, that uh, does it for a question. And considering we're at two hours and I am out of Cavassier, uh, we, we should uh, probably wrap up. So that about does that it. about does her. So, um, I am Weldy at more clappers, M O A R clappers. Andrew, you can always email them. At... Yes. You can email at huskies hockey podcast at gmail.com. Give me any, or send me an email. Uh, remember, you make it uh, this far, you get a prize um, in the podcast, and that prize is writing us a five star rating. So, congratulations. Right. Go ahead, uh, rate us. And, um, yeah, and until next time, go Huskies. Woo!